Well, hello there. My name is Emery Page. Welcome to our neighborhood, your neighborhood, my neighborhood, make our neighborhood. Lowell is a good neighborhood. Now, we have some special guests today, so pay attention. Get out some pencils and papers. You're going to be taking notes. So, we are going to talk about Lowell House. And people say, what's Lowell House? My house is in Lowell. Do I have a Lowell House? So we'll tell them all about it. And our executive director, William Gar. That's me. Right. And our senior director of development, Barbara Dunsford. Barbara and I go way back. We go yes. way back. Yeah. Yes, we do. So we are. We won't and tell Lowell those House online, though. Yep, is located on Upper Merrimack Street, 555 Merrimack Street. They're going to put all that on the screen. Everybody will be able to see everything. Where, when, how, time, telephone number, everything. It'll all be there. So here we go. We're going to ask. All right. Now, Lowell House has been in the community for 46 years. I didn't realize that. See, many people don't know that. I didn't know that. Right. Right? So we're going to ask you about Lowell House. And there's this little saying that goes around called, everyone knows someone. You want to tell us about that? Sure. <laughs> now, I hope you're wrong about that, by the way, Emily. I hope people are sitting out there saying, Lowell House, I'd love to hear more about Lowell House because I've heard a lot about them recently. Uh, look, we know, and we know we're in the worst drug crisis, probably the worst public health crisis in the mm. city of Lowell. The opioid crisis here, and nationally, but really more here in this, and there's reasons why it's very, very difficult in this part of the country, in this part of the world. Uh, and we can talk about that later if we have time. But this is a horrible crisis. In our 46 years, I don't think we've ever had this level of problems and how widespread this is. So a group called NIDA, the National Institute of, of Drug Abuse in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, one of those wonderful agencies that actually does a lot of work and does a lot of very effective research. Dar Dr. Nora Volko is the executive director, and she's one of the leaders of the field, have done a tremendous amount of research. So we're gonna, we're gonna reference NIDA from time to time when we talk because they're very important. And one of the things they discovered in doing a, a survey nationally is that everyone knows someone. And the reason that happens is everybody has someone that has an addiction issue. Now think about it, because we, we go to all kinds mm. of presentations, Barbara and me, mm. and we talk to people and we say, raise your hand if you know someone, a brother, sister, friend, relative, uh, you know, uncle. someone, the uncle, you know, yeah. someone. And I would say m most of the time, 100%, I know someone. Mm -hmm. and then you ask people, how many people have suffered, have pain because of that? Right, right. Uh, because they know someone they can't quite get to and help. Right. Three quarters of the audience. Right. Can. That's so it. So it's one of those persistent diseases, and it is a disease. Right. Uh, and it's a chronic disease. In some ways, not that different from diabetes and all the other diseases we know. Yet, if you have diabetes, you don't feel ashamed. You feel part of a community right, right, and you right. work with your doctor. You're right. And you'll stand up and say, I have diabetes and I'm right. working on it. That's it. it. Uh, and help me not eat the right you're foods right. and get the exercise. If you have an addiction problem, if you're addicted to heroin mm. or you're an alcoholic, which is still a major problem in our community, uh -huh. any of those things, you then say, I don't want anybody to know. I want to be an Oh, that's it. Because nobody wants to identify. It's something no. that we're ashamed no. of. You're right. So I think that's one of the things that Lowell House works on right. and that the city has worked on in the Commonwealth is the stigma of addictions. It having is. People right. come forward right. because everyone does know someone right. and that's everyone it. has someone in their lives. So it's not that unusual and uh, right. we can get very, uh, very easily addicted. There are lots of questions, some of them that you have there, right. about why some people become addicted, why some other people don't, and there's a lot of, lot of research and information we have on that. But for the most part, we as a society that that really has mm -hmm. great access to the substances that eventually cause addiction and all the other, and there are three other portions beside having the substance, three other main drivers of addiction that come into play also. We could talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. but let me tell you something about Lowell House. For the, like, maybe the two or three people out there that haven't heard of Lowell House, just, you know, <laughs> just the fringe <laughs> of your audience. Um, right. Like that, you said. 
They might have heard about it. They're just not talking about it. Well, right, right. <laughs> so all of you out there, you're going to admit that you actually know Lowell House. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the funny thing is lots of times we'll have people call and they say, I'm calling for my brother. And right. It really is their brother. It's not right. Their, uh, but they'll say, I, you know, I didn't know that much about Lowell House, but now, now we need you. So mm. we're there to help people whatever. And our people range in age from mainly 18 on into their 90s. We've I know. Had people, I'm not that scary. We've had women in their 90s that have sought us out to get clean and sober. Right. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story about one woman who was in uh, our Sheen program. Uh, in in Tewksbury, right. which is one of the only program for older women with addictions in in the state, mm -hmm. one of the few programs in the country, and probably the best. So uh, they and that's have, up at Tewksbury Hospital. That's up at Tewksbury. That's where the building it's been is. There yep. since the mid eighties. Right. It's about eighty five, eighty six. But again, quite well, they didn't talk about it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So that woman. She was an alcoholic. She had been an alcoholic all her life. Oh, my God. Had multiple problems, was in recovery, then relapsed, recovery, then re went back and forth, as happens to a lot of people. And she came to us and in her later years and said, look, how many years have I got left? A year, two years, in your 90s, you know. Yeah, right. Other than people like Dr. Giannis, who seem to live for, forever. Forever. Thank God. Uh, so said to me, said to us, I want to I want to die clean and sober. I want to see my grandkids. I mm. want to feel what it's like to have my family around me and have right. them proud of me. That's it. And families are ashamed a lot of times. Oh yeah. So she became clean and sober, and she passed away a, a little while ago, but passed away clean and sober. Right at peace. At peace. Right. Wonderful stories. That's it. We have so many dramatic stories like that. And that, but you you don't think that. You think 90, a little old lady or something. You don't think that. Yeah. And You're I, right. So many people assume that that's the way they are. That's right. the way they'll be forever. Right. My neighbor, who I can't talk her name about, <laughs> went into her 60s. Uh, and she was as an alcoholic and lost her grandchildren. Oh, yeah. Uh, lost most of her family. Right. Went that's into it. recovery. And she is and now clean and sober for almost eight years, nine right. years. Uh, her husband recently passed away, but she's able to handle it and didn't relapse when her husband That's passed away. That's a good away. thing. Right. Again, That's someone it. in the Sheehan program, miraculous, wonderful program. Oh, it is a wonderful program. It is, you're right. Yeah. And, it, and it's, but you know, it, like you said, it's it's scary. You know, you don't, you don't think about it, right, unless it's affected you or your immediate family, right? I mean, in my house, my grandmother was strict grandmother, right, raised my sister and I, and she just laid it on the table this way. Now, ladies, if you don't smoke and you don't drink, you can have a lot more money to go shopping. That was the end of it, right? That's how simple it was, shopping, right? It sounded great, right? But you're right, you don't, but you, you, you're right, because I remember once talking to somebody whose family, there was somebody in the family, and, and, I was angry about it, thinking this person had suffered because that family member didn't do what they should have done and taken care of business. And this person said to me, but it's a disease. Mm -hmm. But see, you didn't think of it as a disease. You thought of it as a weakness and bad, and so you didn't talk about it. Right. You didn't speak about it. Right. Nobody said anything. That's why when you came to our neighborhood group and spoke to us, and the first thing you said, how many people here, who here knows someone? And like you said, could be a neighbor, could be a relative, could be a friend, right? But everybody knows someone, right? And it was the other day I was talking to somebody, and of course I was ticked about something I had read in the paper, and I said, you know, they took the cigarette ads off the paper. I didn't have any problem doing that. I don't see them taking all those other ads off the off mm -hmm. the off the, the television, right? Kick the ball and have the beer, and then kick the ball and have another drink, and then all the fancy guys in the fancy lane, they're all sitting there in their fancy glass, and I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't good. <laughs> this is the wrong commercial. I shouldn't be watching, <laughs> right? But it's like, that's it. It's like they made the drinking glorified and fancy, but I got rid of the cigarettes. And you'll drive downtown, and it's the funniest thing in the world. I fall apart laughing. I'll be driving downtown, and the person has gone in to have a beer or a highball or whatever it is they have, right? 
but he has to come outside to have a cigarette. I'm like, what was the last time somebody had a cigarette, got in a car, drove down a highway and killed four innocent people because they were having a cigarette, right? I'm like, something's wrong. I'm missing something in this picture, right? We, we can talk about substances in a minute because I think it's very important. We can talk a little bit about why people become addicted mm -hmm. uh, because people are always curious about that. Right. But I want to debunk a couple of myths for you that we hear about. We get a lot of myths. Oh, I'll bet you do. Did I pronounce that well? Myths. Myths. <laughs> myths. Tricky. That's one of those toy boat words. Yeah, without you know? getting you all yeah. <laughs> Myths. Uh, I'll end. And one side. of them is about marijuana. Yeah. So let's debunk it right now, okay? And, I don't know. Uh, I would know marijuana if I fell over because well, I'm the generation before, <laughs> you know. But tell me. Well, more than likely, the person with marijuana would fall over you first. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, there's, there's a lot of rumors. And I think what we want to tell people is what the latest research on, on marijuana is because mm. it's probably our most widespread drug other than alcohol. And we all know the dangers of alcohol. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, right. I have a great alcohol story about it. Oh, right. Okay. You have to and, share that with me. Great stories. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that we wanted to, 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 to debunk is a couple of things. First of all, it is addictive. Mm. Now, the main THC, the main drug in there, uh, in the old days, when we were in college and people, people, you know, were experimenting with marijuana. Right, right. It had about five percent of it was THC. All the rest was mm. just, you know, filler and weed. It's like a bad cigar. Right. Uh, but now it has about forty to fifty percent THC. Whoa. So it is a much That's more quite a powerful. Jump. Now, medical marijuana has as much as sixty percent THC in it. Right. So it's a, it is an addictive drug, uh, and people do. Now, the other myth is nobody ever overdoses. Uh, in Colorado, and if you watch 60 Minutes, they reported a number of overdoses. And this is just beginning, because people with more access to marijuana do overdose. So we're telling people, right. be careful about this. Make good right. choices like you make with anything else. And, uh, and finally, uh, you know, they're, they're just because you can buy it, in a store or you can get it some way and the, the police aren't going to chase you down for it doesn't mean it's not dangerous to, to, to babies to babies pregnant women oh yeah right oh Colorado yeah i was reporting now in in one of their major maternity hospitals in denver that almost 50 percent of the women coming in are giving birth to babies with marijuana with thc whoa, in their system whoa. it affects cognition it affects development. It affects a growing brain. Mm. So there is no question. If your high schooler is smoking, right, uh, you know, two or three joints a day, they will be impaired. It, it by through some of the research again, Dr. Volko right. has done a lot of this research. Uh, it can lower IQ by as much as fifteen points, which is significant. If these kids are headed, we to certainly Harvard don't need lower game. IQ. <laughs> no, we don't. We need all the good IQ we can get. <laughs> we don't. So uh, just one of the myths we have to debunk. Right. Because I think people figure, hey, you know, if you the plant, right. you can smoke That's it. smoking, uh, yeah. you know, uh, pieces of your lawn. That's it. Not true. What was it? Years ago, they would take, um, in the season of corn or something, they would take the big strip off oh, the ear yeah, of corn, right. and they'd put the little hairy thing at the end and put it in like it, make believe they were smoking. I don't, there was nothing to it. It was just, but I can remember seeing them do that years ago, you know. It had no reaction. It was just dead weeds. Well, something. Same with bananas. People that the, the myth. So many myths in drug really? and alcohol. In fact, I, I, I love bananas. I know I can mention this because I'm on an LTC show. And <laughs> I, want to, we, I just want to mention our award-winning, as yours is, oh. our award-winning LTC show, Recovery Matters. And one episode we have coming up is uh, uh, is. Bath salts, which is a new drug. It's not yeah. the bath salts. It's a synthetic one and, and one that a lot of young people are, are taking. I read days. that. And, you know, I put bath salts in my tubby. You know, I think that's the greatest thing. You buy it. And, and then I'm reading it. I'm saying. But it's not the same bath. It's not the I bad guess bad not. Salt. That's what I'm saying. This goes in the tub water. What are they talking <laughs> about, right? And I'm trying to connect Actually, what it is. That but stuff that's you it. put in your bathtub is probably safer than the stuff that kids <laughs> are taking on the street. But that's but anyway, crazy. We had a reporter call up, and they say, and they said, I heard that it ate away, that someone was at Lowell General, ate away half their face. <gasps> so we checked with a lot of people, including the emergency staff at Lowell General and our street workers right. and people. A myth. Can it hurt you? Yes, it can. Will it eat away your face? Probably not. That was probably No, something. but that would definitely scare you to death. <laughs> yeah, well, you know something? And, and But we found in the past, and we've done it all with this, Anne-Marie, 
uh, scaring people doesn't seem to work. No, evidently it doesn't. It would work for me, you know. That's it. Like if my father said, don't do that or else. My grandmother said that. My grandmother. She was the word of God, right? That's right. And that's it. And hey, she did. She drove a big Cadillac. She had great clothes, great jewelry. We spent all summer at the Ashworth Hotel. I wasn't smoking and drinking. I was going to follow her path. That was a good one. (laughs) But you're right. right. But the, the problem is that the brain is not fully developed until you're about 21, 22, 23 in that range. Don't be you're still, that. Your Did brain you know is that? still developing. <laughs> well, and if you know any teenagers, you know, they don't always do the logical, smart thing. And that's why they end up taking right. drugs and doing things that they yeah. know. So you can tell them all day long, this is bad right. for you. You know what you're they right. think? Hmm. What does she know? What does she know? You know you're right. They yeah. get to the party and they hand them a handful of bath salts. They yeah. say, eh, I'm going to take them. They take yeah. them. So it's dangerous stuff. And because their brains are still developing, brains learn to become addicted. And uh, that's something that is significant in terms of... So here's another NIDA statistic that I, I find very right. interesting. Yep. Remember, National I get NIDA, NIDA Institute of Drug. All, all those good things. Uh, if, we, uh, if, you, if, if a teenager smokes on a regular basis mm-hmm. before the age of about 21, mm-hmm. uh, and they're talking about... Couple of joints a day. There are a lot of kids. This is smoking marijuana. Marijuana. Now. Okay. Two to three joints a day, but it's true of any drug, really. Right. Uh, any opioid, especially. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're doing that, there is a forty to fifty percent chance of them becoming addicted to a substance later in life and fighting this problem for the entire their entire life. This is a disease that you fight every day of your life until you die. Right. And hopefully you don't die of that drug. No. But I know people in their right. 60s and 70s that still go to AA meetings and right. NA meetings right. on a daily basis. Right. It's a lifelong right. problem. Well, as you said, everyone knows someone. So we say, don't do it. No. Okay? Right. I can almost tell you the chances of your son or daughter becoming addicted if they don't do right. marijuana and they're not smoking marijuana, because right. that's the prevalent drug, is 0.07% if they don't smoke it until they're 21. 0.07% versus that's 40 to 50%. Good. So if I gave you those odds at a horse race, boy, you'd be happy to take that 40, 50%, <laughs> I bet. So that's that's the message that we want to deliver to everyone in, in your audience. I had a quick question, because we were saying like Lowell House. What is Lowell House not? Okay. It is not uh, a detox. People that go to Lowell House are not, we don't detox people, they don't come in addicted. We are not, uh, we are not an agency that really deals with people Mm -hmm. until they're in, oh, let's say about three or four months into their recovery. When they've stabilized in their recovery, we then take over and we're with them for the duration across a lifetime. Right. So from the from the time they're three months, four months in mm-hmm. recovery, and they're clean and sober, right. and they prove to us that they can stay there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they we, we take them in. We work with them in our outpatient programs. We work with them in our recovery programs, mm-hmm. which last six months to a year. We have the men's recovery home in Tewksbury and the she program, which we talked about. Uh, we work with them in our various sober houses. Right. And we want to tell you about our new sober house, too. Yes, we did talk about that at our neighborhood thing, and I did want you to put that one on the table. Okay. So we're going we're to... Move around here and skip like a piece of chessboard. You, you and me, we'll, we'll skip from area. Pay attention now because we're skipping. We I can go from A to Z and B to Y, and you know, but that's it. So, so but no, me, you did mention that is the the state of addictions how it's very serious and very widespread. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've heard of medical marijuana for people going through cancer treatments. Sure. That's all. And the only time before that I ever heard of ma- marijuana, I remember I was a Girl Scout leader, and we went to um, a little meeting or something over school, and this woman came and spoke, and she s- claimed that every person that went on to heroin and big bad drugs started with marijuana. Well, it's interesting. And that's all I knew about it. So it was like, if you don't go there, you won't get in trouble. And that was how long ago? Oh, mother of God, I'm older than God. What was that? Um, Had to be 40, 50 years ago. Easy. Mm -hmm. Easy. So here's what what you do. Find a person that's a recovering person. This woman could say, I'm recovering. And ask them how they started. They're going to tell you probably one of two things. 
either, and, and this is not accounting alcoholics, because alcoholics right. always, always start basically in the same way, just a few drinks socially, and, mm -hmm. and then they drink more and more, it gets ahead of them, and suddenly they're addicted. Right. Uh, but that's, and, and it's not actually the most highly addictive substance. So a quick question here, we'll get back to this. When you look at nicotine, the three uh, real main addictive mm -hmm. substances that everybody sort of has a piece of, uh, nicotine versus alcohol versus marijuana, which is the most addictive? I wouldn't have a clue. Nicotine. Good for you. Thank you. Did you smoke? Never. Good. Good. I'm proud of I you. I don't know how to smoke. Like, <laughs> I remember in high school at the beach, my girlfriend's going to show me how to smoke. I can't. I don't know how to. I can't inhale. I don't know how to. Well. Right? And then, of course, I was at the beach with my grandmother, so there was no way I was smoking, right? But, I mean, that... You're right. And that nicotine, but now which is the second most addictive? Alcohol. Now see, most people would say alcohol. Actually, it's marijuana. Mm -hmm. it's wow. Like on the scale, and this is just two months ago in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, after a long-term study, they tried to look and find out which substance would be most addictive to people out of the three most common ones that people have exposure to. Hmm. And we're not talking heroin, we're not talking right. opiates or oh, yeah. opioids, but the second most was marijuana. And the third one, the third one is caffeine. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably that's the, the lowest one. But again, uh, nicotine, very addictive. Uh, alcohol, less addictive than marijuana. So if we want to say, you know, uh, and, and people often say to us, hey, you know, we sell marijuana in stores, and we sell alcohol in stores, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah, everything. We've been doing it for years. Mm. Marijuana is even more addictive than that. So, and you know how so addictive cigarettes are. So the nicotine, are. oh yeah, you know, nicotine, well now it's like buying a house, I guess, to buy a pack of cigarettes, right? Nicotine is... The most addictive. addictive, then the marijuana, then the alcohol. Then the alcohol. See, I wouldn't have guessed and then that. Caffeine is in there, in there at the lower end also. Caffeine, then, like in coffee. Yeah, and it isn't truly addictive, but it, you know, it's one of those substances that once you have it, when you go away from it, yeah. your body reacts. It's not truly an addictive substance. Uh, it's not classified that way either. Yeah. But it does have a reaction in your body. So well, wasn't that, that something? I know, never knew a, that. Do you know there was a time in this country when you couldn't, you weren't allowed to buy uh, coffee because of the caffeine in it? No. Uh, and uh, because caffeine. Was Imagine a bad what substance. we'd be like if we get up in the morning and didn't have our coffee. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't. Because I grew up with tea. I find the floor. I couldn't make coffee. That's why I have a Keurig. God bless Keurig. <laughs> I mean, our, our house was Scotch, right? My grandmother was Scotch. We had tea. Everything was tea. Sure. So, and my husband's mother was Irish, so it was tea. So, when we get married, and I get to, you know, if we had company, I had to make coffee. It was terrible. It was terrible. Thank God for that Keurig thing. Well, they're signaling us because they're going to get ready to wind down, and then they will come back and we'll pick up on some more subjects. But I think we've learned quite a bit so much already. I'm quite impressed. Glad to be here to really? educate the public. So, Warm up your coffee. Oh, did I say coffee? <laughs> Warm up your coffee. You get a headache if you don't drink that coffee. <laughs> and cool down your lemonade, right? And we'll be right back and we'll pick up right where we left off. So don't you go away too far. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. Hi, may I please have an application? Thank you. Skip the drama. Get your GED. Okay. Take that first step towards a better future and sign up for free classes now at yourged.org. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. 
The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Well, hello there. Welcome back to our neighborhood. My name is Anne Marie Page, and your neighborhood and my neighborhood make our neighborhood. Lowell's a good neighborhood. You be a good neighbor. Now, today we're talking about Lowell House, and William Gar is here, and Barbara Dunsford's here, and we've answered a few questions and tossed a few things on the table. We're going to do this one, and I said this like you say you do not do detox. We don't do. And Lowell House is focused on recovery and sobriety. What's the difference? Explain. Well, <laughs> the difference between detox and sobriety, or sobriety and recovery. Uh, they're both uh, sobriety and recovery are the same. Okay. Synonymous. Okay. So when you're in recovery, you're not using any illicit substance. You, you're you're not currently experiencing substance use disorder is what they call it now. SUD. Uh, that's the newest term. So you're re, you're refraining from any substance that you may become addicted to. And so when we go to places with our friends who are in recovery, you have many friends who are in recovery, uh, they don't have a beer. Uh, now, they may have been an alcoholic, uh, but they don't take any chances. It's not a disease because any alcoholic or any, any uh, former addict will tell you, I'm one shot away from, I'm one drink away from, I'm mm. one pill away from becoming addicted. And that's what happens to the brain because, again, the brain knows and the brain, uh, and the brain is actually, the, let me, I'll describe a quick thing of, of a very simple picture of what the brain does and why this is so important. There are sensors in the brain, and they happen to be in the pleasure centers of the brain. And it's connected to a whole other system, the limbic system, that you go through. But that center accepts two things. One is called dopamine. Okay, we've heard a lot about dopamine. You're a great mm -hmm. runner, and you mm -hmm. run for great distances. Mm -hmm. Your body stimulates dopamine. And maybe you have uh, 80, I think they call micrograms of dopamine that your brain accepts on a regular basis. Uh, about a, a 80, uh, let's say 100. And the 100 gets you up in the morning, gets you happy, gets you hugging your husband, wife, kids. Off to work you go and you're a happy, generally happy person. Mm. Uh, at 80, you begin to get a little logy and maybe a little depressed, but people vary between that. So you're feeling depressed, what's the first thing you do? You run to the refrigerator. You yeah, I eat ice, ice cream. An ice cream. <laughs> what does that do? That stimulates another 20 <laughs> micrograms of dopamine in the brain. Bing. Serotonin is a whole other thing, and it's one of the things that helps us sleep and remain calm at certain right. periods. But the dopamine is the main thing. You run and you run a marathon, you stimulate maybe 200 micrograms of dopamine. So what happens when you begin to take cocaine or heroin? that spikes up to three or 400 micrograms, all the way up to crystal meth. You've heard of crystal yes, meth? Yes, I have. Uh, people make it in their bathtubs, Breaking Bad. All, many people have seen Breaking Bad, the, the series. TV series. TV oh. series, all about crystal meth. Uh, and that boosts uh, dopamine up to about 1,500 micrograms. So you're talking about 15 times the normal amount. And I think with all that, mm -hmm. we would rock around saying, this is wonderful. I feel great. I have this wonderful feeling of euphoria. But the brain, as you know, our body doesn't like things that are out of balance. Mm, right. So it gets it back in balance. It says, oh, whoa, wait a second. Wait a second. Something's wrong in the body here. So it has a little vacuum. And uh, it's called, uh, 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 it's a reuptake, uh, an uptake inhibitor. So what it does is it vacuums out all the, the rest of the dopamine. Then the body also says, well, wait a second, your normal level is 100. You just were at 1,500. I better lower your normal level to 50. And if you do it long enough, your normal level now, probably for a good time, possibly for the rest of your life, ends up being 50, 60, 70. Okay? And as we said, you get down around 50, you have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. I mean, it's, it's tough. So that's how the brain works, and that's how addiction works. So when you're hmm. off of... of uh, any other stuff, but and then you don't get high anymore because the brain is low at all of that. You just need to get out of bed in the morning. You need to get your yeah. heroin right. or your alcohol oh whatever to get that level up. So people fight this their their entire life, mm. and a lot of what we do is to replace that dopamine, uh, healthy things, eating well, uh, falling in love. Remember the first time you fell in love? Yes. 
that dopamine was I'm just, still with the same guy. That's right. So you have that relationship, and suddenly that dopamine spikes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go home, you get a nice kiss at the end of the day, you feel really good about life, mm -hmm. and your dopamine is now at 125, 150, and life feels pretty good. So there was an experiment back a few years ago, uh, and this is how we got this whole thing that, that addicts are weak people. Uh, the experiments basically used rats. Oh. And they, they put them in a cage, and they said, here's some water mixed with heroin or cocaine, here's some plain old water. And always the rats ran over to the, the water that was laced with a substance. Wow. And eventually, they, you know, the first couple of times they walked around, they were kind of dreamy. The second <laughs> or third time, they just did it, and they had to have more and more and more just to maintain that level, and eventually they died because oh they already overdosed. Uh, and so for a while they thought, okay, this is the reason people become addicted, because they just want that substance. And once they get it, they're weak, they can't handle it, they always want it. Right. Not true. So they did a, an experiment back in the 70s that I think is very important to understanding addiction. They did a rat city. And that rat city included some of the most fun things a rat can do. It had cheese in it. It had, <laughs> uh, you know, little wheels that they could run on. Had objects that were warm and fuzzy that they could kind of cuddle up to. And then on the other side was the water laced with heroin or cocaine. They said, choose. Almost invariably, they chose the side with the fun uh, rat city. Isn't that something? So one of the things it goes to show us is when we want to put more dopamine in our system, mm -hmm. how important families are, how important right, good right. eating is, right. how important it is to be loved and cared for. And it's one of the reasons that people become addicted, because they don't have those things mm -hmm. in place. And, uh, and that's a very important distinction, that it's not a case of will, but often a case of a couple of things. And we've talked about sort of the, the stools of the leg of addiction. So certainly one is a substance, because that stimulates things. But the other is trauma. If you've had trauma in your life, right. uh, a disturbing amount of people that are addicted, probably as much as 80 to 90% of the people who are addicted have had trauma in their lives. They've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. They've been mentally abused. They've been abused at some point in their life, or they've been through situations that are abusive. Uh, and the third one is the genes. Genes are very important. What you inherit, not the genes you wear. Right. Those are you can wear the genes you want. It nothing to do with the <laughs> But the genes you, you, so what your doctor should almost always ask you, right. they ask you, do you have a heart condition? In the family? Right. Do you have a liver condition? Right, that's they right. They should ask you, do you have anyone in your family that's, that's been addicted to a substance? Right. Because that puts you at a, uh, somewhere around a 50 to 70% greater right. chance of becoming addicted in your lifetime. So when people ask, look, I used heroin when I was younger and I never became addicted, right. uh, there's a chance that you won't become addicted. Uh, you know, but as substances get even more powerful, they become addictive despite what your gene pool is and despite the trauma, like nicotine. Mm. Anyone can become addicted to cigarettes. But generally for cocaine, for heroin, for some of the other things, it requires something else in your life. And all, uh, sometimes it's just that deprivation of not having the things that stimulate dopamine right. in your life. So when we talk about young kids, they're not gonna listen to logic. We can no. do all the curriculum no. stuff. We can scare them straight. Mm. They don't get scared easily. They don't get scared, especially the kids these days. No, these days, days, yeah. So one of the things we can build into their lives is a forgiving environment, is a loving environment, is a place where they can go do sports, mm -hmm. do all the kinds of things, learn to eat healthy, learn to be part of something, so they suddenly don't need the drugs right. and the alcohol. And that rat experiment right. is very important. It is, it's very scary. When you said the state of addictions in our community, what can we do as citizens in our community? Well... There's a bunch of things, and Barbara's going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that, okay. that you can participate in. All right. But certainly, everyone being aware of what addiction is and what right. it's not. That's it. It's very important. Right. And, and when you said that, it, and, and I think we always thought of it as just a weakness, and it is a brain-based disease. Right. And I've heard that, right, if alcoholism or something, if it's in your bloodline, you have to be careful because it's in the bloodline, and that's what you had just said. That's right. So if it's in your family, all the more reason, don't go there. Right. You know? Absolutely. And, and that's why when you were talking about how drinking um, was glamorous, you know, people all dressed oh, yeah. up to going out oh, and right. having cocktails. You know, when children come home and see their parents, you know, right. on the weekend, having, you know, drinks and maybe getting a little bit drunk. Now we want to interject this marijuana for recreational purposes and, you know, 
kids come home, they see their parents lighting up a joint, smoking, whatever. What message is that getting to the kids? That it's okay, mm. that's glamorous, that, uh, you know, I want to be more adult-like. So we have to be, like, really careful with, with the messages that we're giving to our, our mm -hmm. uh, kids and our families. So um, one program that we have coming up on December 8th is Dr. Ruth Poti, who is a uh, family physician, an addiction specialist. She's coming to speak on... Um, addiction, the crises plaguing our families and our communities. This is going to be open, free to the public, mm -hmm. uh, again, December 8th, 7 to 9, at the uh, um, Elks Club on Old Ferry Road. And uh, this is a, a program that's put together by the uh, collaborative parishes of St. Uh, Mary Magdalene, St. Right. Rita's, and mm -hmm. St. Uh, Marguerite Duville. Right. They came to us a month ago talking about um, how they wanted to address this issue as a community within their parish mm. and sat down with Bill and I, and this is what has come out as the first kind of community awareness That's good. event. That's to, very good. Uh, invite publics to come. We're looking right. for parents, grandparents, concerned mm. individuals to come and hear what Dr. Poti says. And um, again, she's going to talk about it being a brain-based disease. She's going to talk about how families can be aware, uh, maybe looking at signs within their, their kids mm -hmm. to um, just, you know, curtail this issue um, in their households. But Bill knows a little bit more about Dr. Poti because uh, she's been this, this um, really... Um, fabulous specialist. She looks like she's about 30 years old and, and <laughs> she can she relates this material in a very simple way that everyone right, down can to digest. Earth, yeah. Very down to earth. So right. she is actually a family physician with a practice in Greenfield Mass. She still has a very large family practice and she tells a story about how people were coming to her with addiction issues and talking about their families, their kids, their mother and father. And she said, oh, I, this is so widespread, i got to find out more about this. So she actually went and became a board-certified uh, physician in addictions medicine. Wow. And she is now one of the most sought-after speakers in the country. Uh, so we're very glad to have her. She's very dynamic. She's lots of fun, uh, as fun as you could have with this talk. Mm -hmm. but she's very bright. She's got great stories and great uh, graphics she does. And we're very, very pleased to have her. In fact, uh, one of the Lowell High... Uh, headmasters said to us she's the best we've ever seen and they've had a lot of speakers on that's this. good she yeah just, uh, that's what you want you don't want somebody's going to have to lecture boring you know you want somebody that's going to put the cards on the table but hold the interest so that they're going to pay attention i don't want to forget we will also have the voices of recovery there and these are people that have been in recovery for a period of time we'd like to get some hmm. you know people have been in recovery a year or two some 20 years some 30 years and talk about very briefly about their lives and what their challenges have been. And, and it's an every day. People could have prevented some right. of those drug issues they had. So very valuable to people in the community. Right. We have limited seating, so we want to tell people okay. hey, how can they get a hold of a ticket, Barbara? Basically, they need to go online again. Tickets are free, so they would right. go online. Um, they can go online to our website, mm -hmm. uh, www.lowellhouseinc.org, right. and right on our homepage in the upper right corner, there's a, a click that they can go to and this will um, get them into our system for um, free admission. Also, you know, walk-ins are, are, are welcomed right. also in, in case people aren't mm -hmm. computer savvy. But again, this is a, uh, an issue that is plaguing our communities, right. our families. And so we're so thrilled to have mm. uh, one of the, the experts uh, in this addiction. And we uh, can theory. spread that out through the citywide neighborhood leaders that and they'll get that great. word out to the too. Great. You Absolutely. know, that's December that's thing. Um, 8th. 8th. I got it. That's a Thursday and that's at the Elks Club 7 to 9. Right. And I'll make sure that gets out. And the other thing was, Miss Kitty. Uh, Miss Kitty. I don't uh, mean gun smoke. No, I was going to say gun smoke. <laughs> well, we are thrilled to um, have um, former First Lady of Massachusetts uh, Kino, uh, as our keynote speaker, Kitty Dukakis. Uh, as many of you know, she's written a couple of books. She's an author, a philanthropist, a uh, children's um, um, advocate. And she is going to be our keynote speaker at our Celebrate Recovery Breakfast on November 28th, so that's coming up fast and furiously, 7.30 to 9 a.m. at the UMass Lowell Inn and Conference Center. Uh, this, again, you can access by going on our homepage at www.lowellhouseinc.org. Right. That's going to be put up on the screen. They're going to put Excellent. that up for everybody Excellent. to see. And tickets are $40 for the breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, this basically covers our cost. And um, she's going to talk about her um, decades 
um, and addiction. You know, she started out uh, taking diet pills uh, back then. I think they were more like amphetamines. Right. And for many years was kind of hooked on, on um, diet pills. And then from diet pills, of course, alcohol and um, uh, has, go has gone through many trials and tribulations. But she's someone who is thrilled to come to Lowell to talk about um, her uh, recovery and her journey through um, and to recovery. And also, as we know, she and her husband are very uh, beloved by the Lowell community with the work that they did back in the mm -hmm. 80s with the right. uh, resettlement program. So she has lots of friends and fans here in Lowell, and uh, we're thrilled to like welcome and have her here. She's right. a Good. very brave woman, you know. She went through probably the most public recovery right. of any That's official. It. Absolutely. I think we've yeah. had many officials over the years that have had drug and alcohol right. problems. But she stood right up. She made the front right. page of People magazine back during right. those times. And like you said, like even when you came to our neighborhood group and met, and you said, um, everyone knows someone. If you know someone, raise your hand. It wasn't like, you know, did you just win a gold medal? You know, they went there and they're going, me! You know, it was like, you know. Because of the stigma. Yeah, it is. And it is a stigma. With. It is a disease, but society doesn't think of it. You know, I could say, oh, I have diabetes, oh, I have a heart condition, oh, I have this, oh, poor you, when poor you. you. But if yeah. you said, oh, well, I'm an addict, well, I'll go sit at another table. You know what I mean? Right. It, and that was it. It, it is. It's th that stigma society hasn't really accepted. Mm -hmm. you Very know? tough. Right. Very tough. And that Still makes it harder tough. for the person. Right. So That's with it. these community programs, you know, this will sort of um, demystify mm -hmm. the um, sort of its its uh, lack of willpower or this is um, stigma or shame or whatever. You know, all the research is saying That's it's right. a brain-based disease. Back going right. back to the 80s, 90s, right. it's brain-based disease. And, it and, is. and therefore, and, and treating it that way is... Right. is and they, not, they know that now. And they teach that now. And people are slowly learning to accept it now. Good. Good Before time. that, it was society was not going <laughs> to. I do want to say, Anne Marie, we're losing the battle. Oh, that's the sad part of this. That's scary. Twice the twice the numbers of people, nearly twice the number of people, will die in Lowell, uh, and it outdistances car accidents. <laughs> Excuse me, so many things. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, last year I think it was forty-seven. It's already up to almost sixty at this point of the year. You pick up the paper and read it. You know, I mean, you expect to see my age or something. You see somebody and they're much younger. It's like it scares you. Like, ooh. And so congratula you yeah, congratulations to those parents that are putting in the obituaries right. that yep. their, their children yep. have passed from right. an addiction. That's a very brave thing to do. So you ask and, me what people can do. Right. Okay, which I think is important. It is. Be like Anne Marie Page. Oh, big okay. mouth. <laughs> get, in, <laughs> get involved. Right. Okay. Don't stand on the sidelines. No. No. Get involved. Right. Uh, you've been on the Lowell House board. You've been right. an active member to solve this problem. But it's this. Is, you're right because my generation thinks of it as not accepted by society. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. And that's what I found so amazing when you spoke that night. Right. Everyone knows someone. Do you know someone? You know, and slowly you'd see the hand go up. It wasn't like, hey, I know, you know. It wasn't like asking, you know, did you just win an Emmy or something, you know? And it, it was, but everyone knew someone. Right. Everyone knew someone. Right. Right. And what's interesting at those meetings that then, then people turn to each other because their hands are up and they'll say, my sister, right. my mother, right. my, my son. Right. And so... That we break down those walls that people I know. can talk about it. And they want to talk about it right. because it's the most frustrating thing. So people relapse an average of 15 to 20 times over their lifetime. That's scary. And just when you think your son or yeah. daughter has made it and they're, they're holding right. their job. Oh, yeah, it's a day-by-day day fight. One of the most insidious diseases we've ever faced. So right. we need to put more resources in. We need to do something. To fight this problem. Right. So they're giving us a two-minute signal. Anything you want to throw on the table? Before they hit us with a hammer? <laughs> well, as I said, get involved. 
Right. Come to our, That's our it. Kidney Dukakis program. Right. Come to some of the yep. things we do. Get to know more about it. Right. And get to understand how you can help especially the younger people. That's it. Okay? That's what's so scary. Because they have tremendous access yeah. to drugs and alcohol. I know. That scares uh, me so much. And uh, we want to make sure that, they, that they're that they not addicted later in their life. Yeah. It's just, so. it does. It's It really is frightening. And Dr. Protee will talk about that. So I think right. you know, there's this uh, free program on December 8th. And that's a big really thing, important. like you said. That's a free program. There is no reason why you can't come and maybe learn one thing, right? Exactly. And with you... Say it or don't say it. Everyone knows someone. Now, we're about to show you. I'm glad you mentioned oh, that. Oh, yes. <laughs> because in our little film studio right now, we are winding up our, our very nice film called Everyone Knows Someone. That's it. I think we showed it at our gale. I think you'll find it very enlightening for four right. minutes. And I think it really describes some of the issues about addiction. It does. And in, in that, we're here to say we want to help you. We're here to help you. Lowell is helping you know, reach out, come and listen. Come and listen that night, December 8th, and you're sitting there, and you might learn something you didn't know before. And you want to keep that on the back of your head. Brain disease. A brain-based disease is a disease. It's not a weakness. It's not you're a bad, evil person, right? That's what right. it is. So, so they're giving us the old... Shut it down, right? Right. Thank you, Anne-Marie, <laughs> for having us on. This Thank you wonderful. so much. Good, Good luck, and we're going to hope you're going to be there on December 8th. And thank and you for some all people. you've done for Lowell thank House you. and the addiction issue in this community. Well, LTC is going to get this message out there, and hopefully everything will go better. Take care of each other. That's all we're here for. Be a good neighbor. <laughs>